everyone. Welcome back, my friends, to the Sam T. Blues Review. We are live in Chicago at the East 95th Street Bridge, where the famous jump took place from the Blues Brothers movie with cop cards. And... Well, I'm doing something with my hands. You can't see it on the radio. But anyway, the point is, that's where we're at today. I want to thank my co-host and good friend Lonnie Wilkins, a.k.a. Lonford Blues, for sitting and talking with me, talking about all things fried food, Chicago, and, of course, the Blues Brothers. And a few weeks ago, I had the pleasure, the absolute pleasure, of speaking with one of the original members of the Blues Brothers band, Mr. Tom Bones Malone. You might also recognize him from his stint on The Late Show with David Letterman. Here now is the continuation of my interview with Tom Bones Malone on the Sam T. Blues Review. So, I mean, when, when you think about SNL, that 10 years doesn't seem like a lot. There was a lot of changes going on with uh, Lauren Michaels leaving and, you know, the cast and crew, everybody changing. What was, do you remember kind of that atmosphere? What was that like? Absolutely. Well, um, yeah, things, you know, the first five years were pretty steady with, uh, you know, pretty much the same people stayed mm-hmm. with the possible exception of Chevy Chase right. leaving. And Bill Murray coming in, but um, he certainly filled in the shoes. Oh yeah, I think if you go, if you think about all the cast members of Saturday Night Live through the last forty some years, I think Bill Murray is probably the most successful of all of those people. Oh yes, and I remember Bill when he came in. But uh, yeah, things uh, when when uh, Lauren left and we kind of started over. There was a, um, a producer in the sixth year, I'm trying to remember her name, and the show almost went down the tubes. Yeah, they replaced her with Dick Ebersol in um, the fall of 1981. And uh, his line producer was Bob Tischler, who was the producer of the Blues Brothers records. He produced uh, Hmm. Reefcase School Blues, uh, the soundtrack, and uh, Made in America. He produced all three of the real Blues Brothers records. And uh, I worked very well with Bob. And so when he became the line producer of the show, he hired me to be the music director. Uh, Those four years were just full of all kinds of fun. Uh, Basically, Eddie Murphy, Joe Piscopo, Martin Short, (laughs) and uh, Billy Crystal were the most memorable artists. Yeah. And uh, even Jim Belushi, Mm -hmm. who came in 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 83. Yeah. No, the the, the show almost went down the tubes, and so we reconstructed it, and especially with, you know, the talent of uh, Eddie Murphy. Uh, I wrote the music to Hot Tub. Did you really? Did you really? Yes. I didn't know that. I didn't write the words to it. That was uh, uh, Barry Blaustein and yeah. David Sheffield. They were uh, staff writers, but uh, I did write some music for that. Well, speaking of the Blues Brothers, um, when you were when you, so you performed with them, obviously on Saturday Night Live, and then. You know, you get asked to do Briefcase Full of Blues in their live concert, and then eventually the movie. I mean, did you ever see it being as huge as it is now? Well, <clears throat> here's a little inside story for all you listeners out there. Uh, it almost never got off the ground. I was at the first meeting about the Blues Brothers. It was just John and Danny and myself. I was the arranger for the Saturday Night Live band in 1977. I'm thinking it was March or April 1977. Uh, I called in for a meeting on a Monday at 2 p.m. at John's office. Can you meet with these guys? Yes. Uh, they were telling me about the concept they had with these two guys that uh, uh, they wore the same size suit. It was too big for one of them and too small for the other. They wore sunglasses day and night, and they were sort of ne'er-do-well orphan musicians. So I wrote an arrangement of a song called Rocket 88, and we did it for Lauren Michaels with the Saturday Night Live band. And we didn't make the show. Really? John says, Lauren, can we warm up the studio audience? <clears throat> now, uh, we, we did a, a full dress rehearsal at 8 o'clock on Saturday night, and then we did a a real live show at 11.30 with two different audiences. So we played our little song, uh, Rocket 88, for two different audiences, and the band had fun playing it, and it seemed like the audience enjoyed it. So the next week, John and Danny are still hot on the idea of the Blues Brothers. So they asked me to do an arrangement of a song called Hey Bartender. So we rehearsed the Saturday Night Live band. We did it for Lauren. Lauren said, frankly, I don't see anything funny about the Blues Brothers. <laughs> so week number two, shot down. Uh, so John says, uh, Lauren, can we warm up the audience? Sure. Same thing. So the third week in a row, John and Danny figured, well, look, if Lauren doesn't like this, if we're not going to get on, let's move on to something else. <clears throat> anyway, so the third week, after the read-through of all the scripts, Lauren comes out of read-through and says, the show is three minutes short. What are we going to do? <laughs> John, John and Danny jumped on him and said, Lauren, the Blues Brothers. Lauren said, well, we have nothing worthwhile to put in those three minutes. <laughs> you guys might as well make fools of yourselves. That's funny. So he put us on the show, and he also if I remember correctly, put us on towards the end of the show, like at the end of the show, so that if the show ran long, he could just cut us. Hmm. We did not get cut. The Blues Brothers got on the show. Monday, the switchboard lit up with phone calls. 
and letters and cards started pouring in <laughs> from the viewing audience. And apparently, people did think that the Blues Brothers were funny. anything derogatory about uh, Warren Mike. He's, he's, he's always been especially nice to me, and he's always said, you know, very huge success that right. you can't really argue with. I guarantee anyway, he won't be listening to this, but I understand. <laughs> <laughs> I know what you um, mean, though. He's, he's counting his money right now. But, <laughs> uh, and and he's, a, he's a nice man. Anyway, so uh, I, I guess uh, we, uh, we were on the show a couple more times, and we formed mm-hmm. a band that was separate from the Saturday Night Live band. We uh, got a recording contract, went out to L.A., did a live recording. Sold about three million albums right off the top. Hit single on Soul Man. Then Danny Aykroyd starts writing a, a movie script, and he interviewed interviewed all the guys in the band and, to try to get some material. And I told him stories about playing in sleazy clubs in Mississippi when I was uh, fourteen, fifteen years old, where they had chicken wire with a bandstand. And he he put that in the movie among other things. Chicken wire. What do you say we set up for a sound check? <laughs> Excuse me, Sonny. I guess I'll give this to you. You're the tallest one. Okay. What is it? Well, that there is a list of the songs that you boys will be playing. Well, they gave him his orders at Monroe, Virginia. Said, Steve, you're way behind time. This is not 38. This is old 97. Put her in the dispenser on time. Then he turned around and said to his black breeze department, shovel on a little more coal. Started going to school in Hattiesburg, which was about 18 miles from the farm where I was raised in South Mississippi, uh, University of Southern Mississippi. And um, I, I played in the, the jazz band there, wrote some arrangements, uh, and played some solos. And we went to the Mobile, Alabama Jazz Festival in uh, the spring of 1967. And I met Lou Marini, who was there, with the North Texas one o'clock band he had written some arrangements and played some solos and uh so we met each other and he says man you should really transfer to north texas state next year so i did (laughs) and it changed the rest of my life wow and lou and i have been playing together ever since i moved to new york in 1970 uh lou marini moved to new york in 1971 he he was playing with doc severinson's weekend band he got me on that gig um then i moved out to la in 72 to play with frank zappa came back to new york in 1973 to play with Blood, Sweat, and Tears, which Lou Marini got me into. With uh, Lou Soloff was also in the horn section, and Dave Bargeron. Uh, I was a trumpet player in that band, actually, in 1973. 1974, no, 1975, the um, Saturday, Saturday Night Live show started. I can't remember the original tenor player's name, but he, for one reason or another, did not work out. And I recommended Lou Marini. So starting around the I think it was around the fifth or sixth show of uh, fall of 1975. Lou Marini became the tenor player in the Saturday Night Live show, and uh, and then from there, you know, the Blues Brothers. And so, you now we've worked together uh, on and off, one way or the other, for quite some time. We were recently um, in Hastings, Nebraska, for the Jazz Festival, uh, playing together. That's awesome. And uh, they, we did a whole Blues Brothers theme there too. So <laughs> he's cool. one of my uh, closest and dearest friends. Never met a better musician or a nicer man. That's great to hear. So let, before all that, before Blood, Sweat, and Tears and uh, SNL and all that, you started playing professionally at around 14. 
And then I know your big break was uh, working with Brenda Lee, is that right? Yeah, I started playing uh, professionally when I was about 14. Uh, mm-hmm. Some guys came over to my house uh, in 1961. There was a, a couple of guitar players and a drummer and a sax player. And they said, we're going to start a rock and roll band. Do you want to play with us? And I said, yeah. <laughs> so I, at that point, I was pl- I had played tuba, trombone, and trumpet. So I got out my trombone, and they looked at me like I was crazy. <laughs> and I said, I said, what's up? And they said, you don't have trombones in rock and roll bands. I said, why not? They said, well, you just don't. So I said, well, look, I want to be in the band. I want to hang with the guys. I want to meet girls. Uh, so um, what uh, What do I have to do? And they said, you got to play saxophone. So my best friend from high school, Alan Sumrall, he had uh, an alto and a tenor with him that night. So he started showing me how to play the tenor sax. I learned to play primitive tenor sax that night and we started working up some little arrangements and little licks rock and roll licks on the songs within three weeks we were actually doing gigs and it wasn't very glamorous we were doing sock hops and (laughs) and sleazy clubs and i remember the first the first gig we did that the the guitar player leader of the band lead singer leans over to me and says play a solo so i said what am i supposed to play he says anything you want (laughs) i started playing and i I realized very quickly that some notes sounded better than others. Right. So I started thinking about what chord is going on and what notes would actually fit in there. And uh, so my uh, my improvisation was kind of like being like throwing a baby into the swimming pool and it'll learn <laughs> how to swim on its own. It was kind of like that. Yeah. But uh, you know, uh, uh, slowly but surely, uh, I I, uh, um, I learned to improvise. Yeah. When I was uh, in college at North Texas State, I started working with a couple of bands up in Jackson, Mississippi. It was 80 miles to Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, I joined the union up there. And um, once in a while, I played trombone. Most of my work was on trumpet. And then Brenda Lee came to town, and they needed a lead trumpet. I was the only guy that could hit the high note, so they hired me. It was uh, six nights, paid sixteen dollars a night, <laughs> and and I didn't have a car, so I had to hitchhike oh, up there geez. every night and go to school in the day. <laughs> so somebody somebody would drop me off on the highway around two a.m. and I never caught a ride until the sun came up. Oh wow! Yeah, so I had a lot of time to think about the music business. <laughs> Sitting there. They're in my black suit and I like Blues Brothers looking outfit uh, and <laughs> holding my trumpet case. I had a lot of time to think about the music career. Sure. I'm sure that was uh, quite experience playing with someone like Brenda Lee, though. Oh, well, yeah. She had uh, Rockin' Around the Christmas Tree. Which yeah. Was big hit. I'm sorry. It was also her big hit. Mm-hmm. And full talk about Full Cycle, I also was in house band when she was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Oh, were you really? And I, uh, yeah. And we talked about that gig and she remembered me and uh, it was just oh, so that's funny. nice. I'm sorry. So sorry that I was such a fool. Well, Tom, that is all I got for you. I do appreciate you taking time out of your day to talk with me. It's my, I'm glad you took time out of your day to talk to me. It's my pleasure to talk with you. Well, I thank you very much. 